Greetings, horse enthusiasts across America and around the world. I'm Andrew Turnbull for IHA Live. And tonight's a really special night because two of my very close friends are here. One of them is my good friend, Spencer LaFleur, who's an outstanding expert in equine dentistry. And we've got Farrah Green, president of the IHA, who is a student there in New York right now, hanging out with Spencer. Uh, the Spencer LaFleur, LaFleur uh, started the Center for Natural Balance Horse Dentistry. It is now known as the Neuromuscular Horse Dentistry, but it was all founded in 2002 um, by Spencer. Uh, it is dedicated to realigning the jaw to achieve optimal neuromuscular proprioceptive and physical function in a horse's whole body. Balance begins with floating the incisors, those are the front teeth, with the head in a natural posture. This alignment provides guidance and stability to the temporomandibular joint, TMJ. Finally, adjustments to the molar table surface, the back teeth, provide anatomically correct inclination. Through this process, the horse gains a complete and natural movement of its jaw in over six major meridians, and are, they are stimulated throughout the body. This is evident with increased top line and equalized flexibility for the horse. Is your horse bending more to left or right? Is your horse losing feed? Is your horse losing top line muscle? Does your horse have a hoof that's more upright? It, it could be related to its teeth. And tonight we're gonna to talk about how dental alignment affects movement. Did you know that your horse's front teeth should not get longer? or change angle with age. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about how to prevent this from happening, stop or even reverse the damage to not only teeth, but their entire body. I am pleased to welcome Spencer LaFleur and Farrah Green. Hey, you guys, how are you doing tonight? We're great. What's happening, Andrew? Good to see you again, buddy. It's good to see you. Um, so I, before I, we- I wanna, I wanna yeah, go ahead. I want to compliment you on the introduction. I don't think I've ever heard it done more eloquently, more correctly. And I've been a lot of places, buddy, you just stack that one out of the, over the, over the lights, over the lights. <laughs> over the lights. I love it. Well, just to let everybody know about Spencer's and my relationship, um, it was June of 2000. And right. there was 400 of us sitting on hay bales out in the pasture at the International uh, Study Center for Natural Horsemanship and Pat and Linda Pirelli were putting on their annual savvy conference. And this guy comes out and he's obviously quite a personality because um, Spencer's background was he used to be a rodeo cowboy and then he moved on to become a rodeo clown. And those of you that have gone to a rodeo, the rodeo clown is probably one of the craziest and most responsible jobs in the whole thing because they entertain the crowd with, with jokes and, and fun, which as we'll learn tonight, Spencer LaFleur is a total blast. But he also could move quickly and he knew the sport and he could help keep the um, participants and the animals safe. And, uh, but when he showed up, and because of Springs, and we got, like I said, 400 people in the audience, this guy was so excited about horse teeth. And I was still kind of new to all this. I was new to, to natural horsemanship, and I'd never seen anything like it. And then all of a sudden, he pulls out this picture, and it had a horse with braces on. And you kind of go, oh, what's that about? And he goes, well, Andrew, it's really equine orthodontics, because in orthodontics, we talk about how your alignment works for a human. Now, that's about where the, the similarity ends because uh, during our pre-call, we had some discussion about that. A horse's teeth grow all its life, or at least for most of it. Well, you guys- They are, erupt. They erupt. In they erupt. Okay, they erupt. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about also in the pre-show is to think about equine dentistry as being more like um, hoof care because a hoof is growing and you need to take care of it. And while we don't necessarily do this every six weeks, we got to do it on a periodic basis. And then finally, we'll talk about a little bit about my horse, who's 26 years old. It's all about you, Andrew. It's all about Well, you. yeah, I love it. Thank you. But uh, 
the reason I bring up Sonny is because he's 26. He's been a he, he's he's been one of Spencer's um, uh, patients for as long as we've had him. And this horse looks like he's half his age. I mean, 26 years old and he's got he's just in great shape. Everybody can't believe when I tell him he's 26. And I think a big part of that is the teeth. So, yeah, uh, you know, just bringing it back to my own experience that I am also a client of Spencer LaFleur's. So tonight we want to cover a few things. We're going to ask you guys about what neuromuscular dentistry means. And we're going to ask Farah to talk about her experience as a student, because she's actually literally in the class in the Adirondacks in New York right now. And we're and rocking then, the highway up here. What's that? And we're rocking the high waves up here, buddy. We're in the mountains. Yeah, boss. I love it. And then... Um, we will make time for questions, but um, I'm going to really turn it over to these two because they're both educators. They're both going to help us understand a lot about horses' teeth and their care. So Spencer and Farah, have at it. Cool. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I just wanted to mention to everyone, I actually saw Spencer, I think the first time was 2003 at the Savvy Conference. And when I heard just a little bit about how the incisor should stay the same angle during the entire life of the horse, ideally, I was blown away. And we're gonna talk, we're gonna go into detail about that. But I remember that, that was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And- uh, Bob Seeger. I know. And I was like, I remember you when you were like, really going. Well no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have thought about that that is left in my, you know, along with some other points you made at that time. And so it's kind of this amazing experience for me to come through, like, just hasn't been the right time in my life to actually come to this course. And now I'm here and I'm, I'm definitely, uh, it was definitely worth waiting for. So thank the you. Real oh, you're welcome. <laughs> the real amazing part to me is, is that since the beginning of my visionary process of all of this, no matter how rud rudimentally I approached it myself when it was just basically me, myself, and I working on it, um, it worked. The more we refine it and the more it, we work with it, it refines itself as well. Like today, we hit on one of the coolest things. I mean, I got to talk about it because it happened today. Um, it was a Korean doctor in the 60s. And, just became aware of all this today but I've always said there's a huge connection and everything is connected to everything like central nervous system your meridians uh, everything is connected vagus nerve but truly and all of it is hooked together well there's a guy Bong Han Bong Han Bong Han doctor in Korea unbelievable what this man discovered but it's a system that exists within the body that touches every major organ runs over through goes inside of nerves outside of nerves and carries the almost essentials of life like not the entire um, um stem cell but the beginning of one not the entire dna but the building blocks of it and it carries it around in a liquid state. And the only way you can see it is if you stain this and then it shows itself. But other than that, it's almost clip, uh, um, translucent, okay? You look through it. You don't know that it's there, but it is what I've talked about for years. And I just have to start there. I know it's putting the cart in front of the horse, but- But I think they'll see, you know, as we go through the presentation- Research eventually gets you to the answer is what I'm saying. Well, and and as you see how the TMJ is connected to all of these different um, nerves throughout the body, it's really like uh, when you turn a faucet on or off, the slow, you know, the tighter that faucet is, the more closed the valve, the less circulation, the less communication through the body, and it it's so affected by um, what's going on in the teeth. So let's let's start the presentation. Is that okay Absolutely. with you? Sounds good to me. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. Awesome, looks great. 
All right. So Spencer, you have at, this is all about you. Well, it's all about the horse, but um, it is all <laughs> about our research. Um, I've been fascinated with horses for a long time. I grew up as a little boy on a dude ranch in uh, Northern New York uh, in the summertime. Um, and we ran 300 to 500 head of horses. I always wondered why the horse's body seemed to deteriorate before like our dog or our cat. Um, and then later, much later in life, um, I thought, well, you know, um, my career is over as a, a rodeo cowboy, as a clown. What are you going to do? So I got into horsemanship. Then after I got into horsemanship, I realized um, what they really need is somebody to help them with the teeth and alignment. So it's like a very specialized form of mechanics in racing. Um, and we began from that angle. Then I realized very quickly it had nothing to do with mechanical. It was all neurological. And then I got, and this is also very, uh, how do you say, blessed in many ways. But I, I mentioned this with the talk with Andrew um, that it was always about the time I stepped up the stage on at, at the Savvy Conference, but somebody said something to me about something. And it then led me on a whole nother journey. Like when I learned about Dr. Weston Price and many other people that were just so far ahead of their time. Um, it was absolutely amazing. So that began as a natural balance, but then it didn't take very long to understand that natural balance is not what we're looking for. What we're looking to do is to help the domestic horse. And then it became balancing the teeth according to the rotation of the TMJ and where you were getting the turn on. And the turn on comes when you balance the mouth and you get it just about I say, you just start opening these pathways, um, the incisors, and once those are capable of anterior, posterior, or forward and backward motion of the jaw, uh, it opens six major meridians that pass through the TMJ, as well as the vagus nerve and the um, cranial nerve. Vagus nerve runs from one end of the horse to another, but when we discovered this um, system today, it was so eye-opening because it's how it all turns on in a nanosecond. Because literally while you're balancing a horse's mouth, if we had the ability to do size registration and um, energetic pathways, you'd blow your mind. It'd look like a light show at, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, one of these rock concerts, um, just unbelievable. Now we're working on nerves that pass through and that's what I was just starting to elaborate on. Um, this TMJ, when it doesn't move in a forward or anterior position, it just shorts out everything in, in that joint space. So all that passes through that um, is inhibited to some degree or another. And this is where you get ghost lamenesses in your horses and, or you have a particular uh, joint that you can't hold, like an adjustment that your chiropractor constantly adjusts. Um, these are signs that you don't have balance in your horse's mouth and it's Im almost impossible to maintain. But like I say, once that jaw moves forward four or five millimeters, um, it's all good. Um, but uh, once you have that jaw move forward, it brings all this on. And literally while you're standing there, you can watch. And it can happen to where the horse's color changes in 24 hours. Oh yeah, and we have, a, we have some really cool pictures. So in this picture, what we wanted to highlight was right here is your TMJ joint. Can you see the pointer there, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, we can see it under the 19 to 20, 22 area. Yes, yes, and then you're also visualizing the meniscus in there. And look at how many, this is just the veins and arteries, but the nerves are always also passing through there and look at how much congestion. Can you imagine when that's pinched together? Yeah, but on top of that, inside the nerves, outside the nerves, you have that, um, say it again, please, that gentleman's name for North Korea. Oh, uh, yes, um, Wong Han. Bong, Bong Han. Yes. Bong Han. Yes. But anyhow, <laughs> this discovery, is why it works like it worked. I've been 20 years trying to figure out coming to this day, Andrew, 20 years, buddy. We may, we, we, 
I say we hit a milestone again, man. Oh, and I love it. Share this with everybody because it's been a long time. I've had a vision. Now I can explain the vision. Now right. we need to, how do you say, get the next connection where we can actually get in a, a facility to where we'd have all the intricacies to prove all this. And mm -hmm. to actually measure yeah, the energy but, but changes. Validate. Yeah, exactly. Show the energy changing. Show the validation to all of this. So just keep that in mind as we go through here, how much is actually going through that. And you're joint. talking about, you know, it's, it, it's pinched, Betty. Now, here's where I did my paper. What? Well, just before I came to the Savvy Conference, man. I remember that time, paper. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was there one year and then I did this. And these were dude ranch horses that were between the ages of um, nine and 18. They had no change in diet, exercise, anything. They had had traditional equine floats or dentistry where they remove the edge and work on pathology. What we did was to balance the incisors for guidance and then pathology, all pathology flattens out. It lacks inclination. You don't have to fix pathology. You have to fix the inclination and then the AP or forward and backward, I mean, forward and backward motion and lateral translation creates the rest, the, the final restoration. So you and can, because the teeth are calcified nerves, they must be, and it's all about disclusion, not occlusion. It's a body of energy that the teeth kind of float and hang out on. And as that jaw floats back and forth, think of a very, very, how do I say, uh, integral idea of a slide trombone. Only in this case, as it slides, it's a sliding USB port that controls all of the neural function. Wow, that's a great way to put it, actually. Uh, and look at these photos. You can see, you know, the yeah. Top, I mean, look at the coat. The, the, I mean, this isn't because they all all of a sudden got turned out one day. Before and after, there's no shine in the before. And this is just one of the horses of that study. And that that is the the science behind this is called terrestrial photogrammetry, and it's used in human medicine to document document aneurysms and tumors, and it can measure within five microns, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. But what we showed in that and top line now, not total body mass, but top line. We had a 69.3% top line muscle mass gain. Now, if you want competition and you want to go faster, I can take barrel racing horses and guarantee a quarter to a half a second increased time speed. They're usually winning barrel racings by a thousandth of a second. Just, just wow. by in their teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just by balancing their teeth. Well, balancing them anatomically correctly. And now we're looking at incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Now your premolars have a slightly different angle or diminished angle to your molars. And what will dictate a lot of that is the skull, the um, width of teeth that is dictated by um, the ganache, which is in the back of the head, you put your, you where the jaw flares apart. If you put your fist back there, if you can put a fist in there, that's a good size space that will create a very nice wide based, um, teeth that will then stabilize, um, as far as how it moves. Some, if your ganache is tighter or narrower, it's going to create a very unstable and you can see now on this inclination um uh, the red lines and then the molar tables themselves um and it's not an exact angle that you're looking at because the teeth are um not at a, a place where you could call ground zero okay mm -hmm. so we're just kind of putting some ideas of uh, angle on to, to show people that it shouldn't be flat Okay, so you have edges, you have rims, you have a lingual, you have a palate, and you have a buckle. Okay, so the lingual portion of the lower uh, part of the teeth is where the edge is. But if you're always focused on the edge, you take that angle away and you invert it or reverse it. And the other thing is, is that if you have a very accentuated edge, 
The edge is not the problem. Go to the opposite or outside of that lower set of the teeth and look at the rim. Balance the rim, the, the edge will reduce itself because it goes through a proper mechanical motion. The same is true on the top. And we'll see that in the slides about how this moves. So just so you know, the angle of inclination right here, the again, those teeth in the back, the very far ones are the molars. Then we have the premolars. The front ones are the incisors. So you see that there is definitely an angle that is needed here. The next slide we'll see is, is how that, that actually moves. And maybe before we jump to that, yeah. I'd like to say one other thing. It's the palatal rim that really opens the door to this uh, in a big way. On the very last two teeth on the top arcade, the bottom, if you've ever felt a, a skull or a, a jaw of a horse, your bottom set of teeth narrow as they go back. The top set of teeth are actually like quarter circles, and they are the same width and di um, um, what do you call it? Uh, width and um, size from the front to the back, it's just a, a circle. And we've named that the curve of Cameron. Now, the thing I'm getting at is that back set of teeth, the inclination drops and it's radically off from the bottom because that's where it got very steep. Well, what we came up with, and in fact, it was one of my instructors because I kept talking about matching bite planes said, what about this palatal rim? So we went and he took up the palatal rim. I remember when he brought it back to class. Um, I like to say, like Henry Ford uh, said, you know, uh, I may not be the smartest guy on the planet, but I'm smart enough to involve a lot of smart people around me. And I've been blessed with that fashion. And when we put this together, I couldn't wait to get out of the class and go work with it. And it, it was 100% right. And it changed everything. Because what happens is you take that from a real big time inversion there and then you match the bite plane of what you had on the bottom, your jaw floats now. And as it comes up and seats itself, the buoyancy of the TMJ is finally realized. But and anything else doesn't ever get it. Uh, let me explain a few of the terms that Spencer used. Um, <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> Welcome to shop. Just Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you really appreciate and understand what's going on. So when we're talking about these edges on the teeth, so on the top, the edges on the outside, the outside is called the buccal side. The inside is the lingual side on the bottom, on the top, because that's where your palate is. So, so because of these two sides, the sharp part is called the edge. This part of the tooth that is closer to the palate that's called a rim. So that's where that it angles up. Thank so you. on the bottom, on the bottom- It's the opposite. Yes, the rim is actually on the cheek side. So the lower part is actually on the cheek side. That's called the rim. And then the one toward the tongue, the lingual is called the edge. So we have two edges, one right here, one right here, and then two rims one right here and here. And so what Spencer is saying is traditionally, um, the focus has been on, on floating the edge, but actually what that does is it flattens the angle. And so, it, it also, especially on the top, when they bevel that angle, what they usually do is they go and they bevel it. What that does is it limits the lateral translation in your horse's jaw, but anywhere from two to three inches. So what he's talking about is the movement, the translation, the movement. Right, that's why your horse looks so good, Andrew. So yeah. what he said, his, his, him and his uh, instructor discovered was when instead of focusing here on floating the edge, they have been focusing, of course they, they understand edges, but they've been focusing on the rims. And by doing that, the motion actually adjusts the edges to the appropriate angle instead of decreasing well because the angle. of the lateral translation we do not have limitations which create the edge make sense you have limitation in that lateral translation it literally creates the edge and you'll see andrew we're going to show some motion videos so you'll understand that more oh, okay yeah. uh and that elliptical thing and the, uh, the jaw moving that th this is paramount to 
how your food bowl is moved because as the jaw moves down, out, up, and in, your tongue moves in the exact opposite. And then you have an anterior posterior motion that is complemented by, as I said, lateral translation. Okay, so all of that. So we have the jaw moving in a circle. And actually, I'm going to bring up a little video that's going to explain exactly that. Gotta love the artwork. So can, oh, I don't know if I'm sharing. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the um, optimizing here. You guys have been doing some work. This are you, is great. Yeah, yeah. Are yes, you seeing have. this, Andrew? Yeah. This, okay, so, yeah. Okay, so it's gonna go through and it's gonna go show that. Here's the TMJ joint. Okay, here we go. So you want to explain? So that? it's down, out, up, and in. And you see how that angle, when they come together, it, it completes the stroke. You see that? Yeah. Can, can you see how your incisors, if we were really perfect there, the incisors would have more of a, a, a contact point. But now you see how that is a like a uh, more of an oval shape right there. Mm -hmm. What happens when you develop the edge on the inside on the lowers and the edge on the outside, it traps it into a vertical translation, which looks more like a point, uh, um, an egg with its point in the air. It narrows, it goes vertical more than it goes and translates. And it's the edge that traps you and then the rim that limits the uh, lateral excursion. Now we're looking at how you can, yeah, see it? There it is right there. Oh, this is cool. Isn't that cool, Andrew? Yeah, I wish, very cool. I wish I had this 20 years ago up exactly. on Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was like uh, walking around trying to get everybody to see the stars. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what it's changing to. There we go. Wow. So many hinges and levers and changes and things. I mean, um, it's just, uh, it's amazing that they, how do you say, they just don't like wig out and stomp us into the ground the way they've had their teeth done. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you're so dysfunctional, I mean, it must be totally frustrating to know you could do something, but you don't know why you can't. You just can't. Yeah, and they're not exactly, um, because they just say nay all the time, you never really know what they want. <laughs> well, Andrew, come on. And, and once in a while, they <laughs> they do say yay. You haven't been to a Seattle uh, Seahawks game, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. And the, the one other thing that, that you can't really see from that video, but you have to consider the anterior posterior movement of yes. that jaw. So not only are we going in the circle, but we're also, the jaw is sliding backward and forward. So any sort of hooks or pathology that limits that motion also puts additional stress on the TMJ as well. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Okay. So we already have a question. Somebody asked if the horses always chew in the same direction or do they sometimes okay, they'll move back and forth uh, like we do, Andrew, uh, as long as their dentition does not create disruption. Uh, and by that, I mean, like, uh, do you once in a while, like hit and miss and bite your cheek, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so um, those hit and miss things, um, horses are real aware of because they're in their homeostasis state all the time. They don't get just um, distracted with abstract thought. Would you say um, that they should chew in both, both directions, but if you always notice your horse chewing right. in one direction, yes, that's, yes, that's not a good thing. Exactly. Yes, that's. And we're going to, we're going to keep um, pushing on with the slides, keep asking those questions in the chat and we'll be sure to get to them by the end. Um, if they're short, we'll answer them throughout, but please keep asking them. Promise we'll get to them by the okay, end. Okay. Now this age interruption thing here, this is our best guess at when you kind of start um, in the middle of the ball game, so to speak, um, is you notice the zero to five years of age, 
and it has a pretty widespread 16 to 23 millimeters. Well, that doesn't obviously happen in just like a moment. But what we're talking about is the shedding of baby teeth. And if you consider the thickness of a, a proper cap, and by proper, I mean when it should shed, um, you're going to have that much eruption. But as it goes five to 10 and you've gone through your baby teeth year, we estimate three millimeters, then it starts to lessen. But what I also realized is that if we could have a neuromuscular approach to balancing the teeth, I believe you would have a, a slowing of the eruption process throughout the entire life of the horse. Now, obviously, after the shedding of the teeth would be the point of change. Um, and then I think you could elongate years. So average years of horse could change from, you know, mid twenties to mid thirties uh, with 40 year olds not being out of the question. I love this, it. This is so important. I hope people understand. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, 30 or 40 year olds that can only ride the bench, Andrew, you know? Right. They're still active. My horse at 26 is still going. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's yeah. I mean, competing. Something's, got, something's got to keep pushing you. Yeah. So this is this is what Spencer was talking okay. about. This is what it's all about. Now, when you look at this, you see that black line. That's your your what you call um, clinical crown, or that which is above the gum line. Then you see to the left of the screen the five year old. That is all your reserve crown. Okay, so here's your money market managing account. You want to keep all that for as long as you can. But you look over to the right and you see the twenty five year old. Now we're all out of reserve crown and here we are. But I, I believe with a much more dil diligent op, um, approach to balance, we could maximize the life of the reserve crown and, and really extend the life of horses. We would not reach what we have reached in this horse on the right so quickly is what I'm trying to share. Mm -hmm. And it does happen when you have very overactive traditional type equine dental approaches they reduce teeth so much that you know they're expired like in the cutting horse world with the bit seats uh, it's not unusual to see the number six teeth expire at between 10 and 12 years of age and when i say expire i mean fall out of the mouth so it's it's like this is so important everyone right now i hope you realize you can prolong the life of your horse by carefully balanced dentistry and literally like you know how do you say the um uh, oh what's that um the springs um what am i trying to you know the cup of life um or, um the, the fountain the, of youth the fountain of youth yeah you literally found the fountain of youth that's really amazing wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah okay um yeah okay the long and the tooth thing um you know i was amazed when i first started this work i would talk to 80 plus year old farmers ranchers all those kind of people and when you asked them what did you do you know when you noticed something going on in your horse's mouth and they always said they would correct the front teeth they never stuttered they never like went man eh, i don't know um, they always want it because back in those days, people were much more mechanically minded about lots of things. And, and they just went out and, you know, oh, well, you'd fix it like this. And um, it, it's a rude way. Of, I mean, it's a crude way of doing it, not rude. Um, and but yet you could uh, well, very well keep them balanced with that, because if you took out any, any um, interferences, it would continue to allow for the back of the mouth to really be better balanced than it would be um, and because if you have lateral translation you don't have problems with the edge you're not going up and down you're going sideways so that would eliminate and that's another little topic here quickly mm -hmm. is if you have someone evaluate your horse's mouth with the two finger touching in and they go oh he has points well take your hands and put them on the outside of that horse's mouth and rub on the points and see if it disturbs the horse because that's really what we need to know. So it's a good counter um, um, idea to do 
to show that your horse is really not bothered as long as it's translating laterally. If it's stuck in a vertical pattern, th then it's going to be bothered by you rubbing on it. And we have a picture of that later. Yep. Okay, too. cool. And so this was uh, what Spencer was saying, like, this is kind of what happens with traditional dentistry, right? That we expect the teeth and it's actually shown in age charts. We expect those front teeth to get longer and longer as the horse gets older, but that's and, and not necessarily what could happen. No. And the other thing about the elongation and the, and the pronation of the teeth is all due to the fact, like, if you take a post out of the ground, lean on it, it's going to bend over. Now what you're looking at is our um, paradigm over multiple years of maintaining, not maybe as tight of length and angle, but it also doesn't let it just blindly erupt with nowhere. Um, so it's a it's very good compromise and it works out wonderful for the horse. Natural head position, um, you can see in this picture, the horse is relaxed, um, heads in a natural position, we're adjusting it there. Um, you allow uh, the relaxation and release between in, in adjustments. In other words, I might make about two strokes on this horse. I would take my hand out, I would shut the speculum. This is needed for the horse to be able to assess what we're doing, what um, channels of energy and um, uh, other inf um what do you call it? Um, input of uh, energetic flow. They're mm -hmm. happening literally while we're adjusting because teeth are calcified nerves. And as such, there's a whole energy channel that they run on as well as your acupuncture meridian. So it, mm -hmm. it's very complex electrical system. So by closing that speculum, you're actually Let allowing them... the horse to readjust and well, therefore it's... you're probably gonna change your perspective based on what they oh, do. Oh yeah, possibly. well, and, Andrew, you remember watching this. People were yeah. amazed at how horses walked into me. Nobody has a horse that walks into them is what everybody said. Well, they walked into me because I was, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was changing the energy in oh, wow. the animal and they were recognize it and they're going more. You got it. There's a little over here. There's a little over there. And uh -huh. you're, and a, a, another big point here is you're addressing the incisors before any of the other teeth, because as you can see that metal plated speculum, it's statically level unto itself. If there's any asymmetries or imbalance of the incisors, you're going to A, uh, vertically um, chip away at the tooth. In other words, it's going to ver vertically fracture, not the whole tooth in, in, in between, but it'll chip, okay? You'll notice chips on the um, edges of the teeth. Whereas if you balance it, it's going to be balanced on the speculum. Now we can adjust the back of the mouth correctly the first time I didn't even, with minimal adjustments. I didn't even realize, but of course that speculum is a level surface. Yeah. So it's helping you yeah, exactly. equalize the joint, of course. Because many other types of equine dentistry, they do the back of the mouth first. And if they've made too much of a, you know, like there's well, a gap, you they just open that side? Yeah, why not? Let's go. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> here we are. Uh, I'm always about two jumps ahead. That's you know perfect. that, Andrew. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most veterinarian dentists and most equine dentists do not address the incisor at all. Well, it's the guidance. Look at look at the bottom picture here. Imagine if you didn't do anything with that. Well, the jaw can't move, man. It's locked. And we yes. have a situation where the um, tooth structure on the top doesn't match the mass on the bottom. Many different reasons for that you can have like seven teeth on the top and six on the bottom, or you can have five on the bottom and you can have six on the top and they meet equally. It's, it's really crazy what you see. I mean, you can be going along doing work and all of a sudden go, oh, wow, look at that. This horse has like five teeth, but look, look what, what it does. Or they're rotated to one side. You know, the misalignment of bite is unbelievable. And that, that all is, I think, strongly attributed to inbreeding. Well, the end oh, oh, notice okay. this picture. Yeah, all of that too. <laughs> yeah. Notice, notice this picture. So people think that at a certain age, horses develop what's called a hook. So this is what's called a hook here on this bottom picture. This is actually my mother's horse, Rory. I know she's watching tonight. 
probably oh, wow. horrified. Hi, mom. <laughs> Your horse is going to be okay. <laughs> but if you if you look at the top picture, you can see that tooth really should not have that hook. And I was for some reason under the impression that this was growing, but no, it's actually because of the incorrect alignment of the premolars and molars that the bottom teeth have worn a groove into yeah. this top tooth. You can see that. And so, yeah. but if we left this here, it would so limit the backward yeah, and forward can't. motion. Yeah, the anterior yeah. posterior motion of that jaw, it would just continue to worsen and, and make the teeth more imbalanced. Would that be correct, Spencer? Oh yeah, and you'd have ghost lamus in, in this horse. You wouldn't be able to keep him um, chiropractically adjust, It'd just be a nightmare for the horse and for the owner. Yeah. So don't worry, mom, we're coming to fix it. Yes, actually, mom, <laughs> she's coming home to fix it. I'm teaching her how to do it. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, okay. so here's your favorite page. <laughs> yes, the molar tables. And now we get down to the lovely site of texture. It doesn't, we, we can't really give you the whole thing, but think about ribbon candy and in multiple enamel folds. And this is how it works. And you see that edge, it's not really protruding in a way that it would limit it, it would limit lateral translation. Now it's got a few, how you say, things that it needs um, adjusted and minimally speaking. Um, yeah, just a little it, is what you're saying. Right, yeah, my, uh, so little, Andrew. And I mean, you've watched me work and like you're done, yeah, I'm done. I don't need to grind on them for 45 minutes. I need to adjust them. And we don't need to take a lot of tooth because it goes back to the reserve crown. Be minimalistic in the way you adjust so that you can maximize these teeth. Because again, it's not about eating. It's about a neurofunction, man. Um, taking the edge will only decrease inclination and diminish lateral translation. Uh, texture of enamel faults promotes the um, shearing of food. It literally works like a cheese grater. It doesn't work like a cutter. It, it, it's, it's a great, it, it opens the food bullets. And then we have to understand that we have fermentation, not digestion. So you got a furnace that's like cooking on uh, vegetable oil, you know? So, so what Spencer is talking about in this picture, it shows the edges. This is actually the molar table. So this is the back of the horse's mouth, okay? We're looking at that from a side view. And it's a pretty cool angle of that. So these, this is an edge on the buccal side on the top of the horse's mouth. This is next to the cheek. And this is primarily where veterinarians will focus on the horse, horse's float. And you can see that, that it looks quite sharp there. However, what he was saying about what he has discovered is the opposite side of this tooth is called the rim, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can see actually here that it's sticking up and above. It doesn't have a nice smooth angle of inclination. You've lost the inclination right in that area that she's pointing out. So what he's saying is if you take the rim down instead of focusing here, and, and of course, if it's super sharp and it bothers the horse, like he said, if you run your hand along the edge and they, they flinch, yes, it's a problem. But if you take the rim down, you preserve the angle of the tooth, the angle of the in inclination that you need for correct jaw motion. And this edge oftentimes- oftentimes will naturally wear away. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. And yeah, this is going to be- It's the real answer to it, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. You're leaving more teeth to do what it needs to do. Uh, and the horse will help naturally when you set them up to, for success. Yes, absolutely. Well, and like Spencer said, and actually I think We'll get to the picture here, but these enamel folds are so important. If you take those away, the tooth will not function properly. Mm. And so we wanna preserve as many of these enamel folds. We want it to be sharp so that the horse can shred that material. Plus as it shreds, the, uh, um, what, what do you call it? The mastication and mm -hmm. actual eating promotes the laying down of secondary dentin. So, Overdeveloped um, temporalis muscles will create, I love this, the cookie monster up and down jaw 
movement versus uh, elliptical. As we can see on this horse that we're looking at um, in that uh, area just above the white star on like a teepee type uh, setting, you have yeah. there, you, um, those muscles have overdeveloped. There, that is the muscle that causes the horse's jaw to move vertically. And oh, wow. if, we, if we looked at the muscles on the um, jaw, those are your masseters. What we would find is more um, the traditional equine dentist would cause your left TMJ to enlarge, your left masseter to atrophy, your right masseter is going to get bigger. Um, the temporalis will also be enlarged, but this is the effects of a right-handed dentist. Yeah, he's he's working on this. Yeah. He's not balanced himself, right? Yes, and then when you take away that um, um, uh, inclination and you have basically inverted the inclination i mean the yeah you've inverted the inclination the right the right side of the horse kind of stays okay so, so if you're coming as one of us as a neuromuscular dentist you want to start on the opposite side because the horse is going to fight you six ways uh to sunday over doing the, the, what they think is the same thing well, and then you get, he was saying, and if you start on the left side of the horse, you get more of this up and down motion versus right. this elliptical motion that you want. So if you have points on the outside, on the buccal side of those edges, that's when it starts to hurt the cheeks. But again, we want these teeth to be sharp. If you're moving like this, you see that you're not, it's not causing that vertical motion. You want really so nice mo the teeth. movement of the razor blades in your mouth is what she's trying to tell you. <laughs> so it doesn't well, we cut. Talk, we, we talked about that a little bit in the pre-call that when you look at what they eat, which is different from what we eat, where I know when I've ever chewed on a hay, you know, a little bit of hay, it's, right? it's not typical what we would chew on. Right. But yet, this is what they typically would chew on. And so they need to have the tools to process that, uh, that the grass, the hay, the alfalfa, right? Right. And then the other thing that we have been very involved in in the last few years is environment. In other oh. words, the environment of the uh, domestic corpse. Um, teeth should be sharp, but they should be in a biomechanical motion that it doesn't interfere or cause them to, um, what do you call it, uh, have pre-compression of the one area, which then a pre-strike, that then can cause a disruption of the bi biomechanics. So sandy areas, sharpened teeth, um, shreds, coarser grasses, uh, the, the enamel um, folds. Um, the softer feed leads to more pathology. Um, if you're balanced, the wear will not continue. And, uh, and you have to forgive me. This is not the right picture. I was going to put a horse eating like grass here. <laughs> so this yeah, is I not told, a normal I, environment. I told her to leave the Northern Lights. I mean, it's really cool. The I mean, Northern I'm, Lights, I'm, yes. But, but I mean, I'm enjoying it. But, it but actually, we were talking about, uh, Farrah, we were talking about it that uh, because I'm out here in California, which is uh, principally desert leading right. to beach, if you will, right? We do have more sand out here. We do have a more rocky kind of soil. And so we're kind of on the plus side of that, right? Whereas yes, exactly. because if somebody you doesn't have that. Like Georgia or, or Alabama, where it's a lot of clay, you, you got to really work twice as hard to maintain that nice, sharp, crisp edge. And I know we keep talking about, you know, the edge and not overdeveloping it, but it needs to be like really fine cultural, uh, cutlery you know and and what i've realized of course is um <laughs> i mean my baby horses even my big horses they'll i'll give them the end of my training stick that's kind of a rubber handle and i let them chew on it and you know it's not a big deal but i'm thinking oh my gosh i am not providing enough 
diff diversity for my horse to actually go and work his his mouth properly and to actually wear his teeth properly so i'm going to go out and try to find some make sure i provide some coarse hay as well as you know whatever if i have like a finer hay i'm going to go look for some tree branches to put in there so my horse can chew off the bark and eat the leaves and it's and he Spencer oh, wow. was talking about, yeah, Spencer was even talking about like putting a rope in there for babies that are shedding caps, like hanging a rope so that they can chew on it. And it actually and they'll helps actually them. pull on it because in the wild, they would do that and they would pull their own baby teeth. That's, totally. what, they're, that's what they're doing when they're irritating you as babies. But when they take the lead rope, they really wish you would just hold it and they could go mm, and snap it and they pull their baby tooth out. But as you know, as well, horses of any age, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go find some more different substances for them to chew on so that they can um, actually wear their teeth a little bit more naturally. So uh, well, I, one thing I love here right now in the moment is suddenly we see a behavior in a horse, uh, you know, a youngster and I've had, you know, Dutch boy, I got him just before he turned three. And I remember when he was young, he, he wanted to bite on the rope a lot. And I'm like, yes. hey, I paid a lot of money for this rope, buddy. But, <laughs> yeah, but now you're exactly. explaining that there was a, a kind of a biological uh, thing that he wanted to solve with that. And I, you know what I, uh, I, you were you know, providing I had enough money. I bought him another one. I let him bite on it. Some people like, well, you're crazy. But apparently I was doing him a favor to let him play. Well, absolutely, Andrew. Absolutely. Well, and yeah. I was even thinking, Spencer, I have these tires that I use for like training obstacles and my horses will go and chew on them. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. gosh, you know, I, I, and the wood, like provide them actual wood that they would prefer to chew on versus your fence. Like if your horse is trying to chew wood, they're maybe telling you something. So anyway thank you yeah. that's what i learned today they, One of the naturally, today. they naturally chew on trees i know that when i'm in a trail trial and i hook my horse up to a tree he may choose to actually dine on the tree right now well, i don't know that he's eating it or whether he's just using that for some mechanical thing because you got me thinking different here right but um he definitely does want to bite on the tree but i I know it's it's a different way to think about it. Well, here you go, Spencer. You can. Talk All right, about so this. here we go. We're gonna get dive into the bear den. Um, power floats. Um, they have no place in a horse's mouth. Uh, it's like uh, trying to do um, cabinet work with a chainsaw. Um, it's not accomplishable. Uh, you remove things too fast, um, and a by sight evaluation of the mouth is not near as precise as a um, tactile where you touch it. Um, it stops the production of secondary dentin by inverting the bite planes. You can see that this is a very unnatural head position. The horse is being hung from the ceiling. Um, I've seen horses subluxate at the, the occiput when they do this because the, they heavily sedate them. Because Jeez. of the power and they actually come dislocated in their TMJ. Right. Oh no, my god. The occiput, oh. not the TMJ. Oh, the occiput. Yeah, oh. right here. Oh my god. Where do you think all the pressure is? Look oh at what they they torqued them with. If they picked them up like in a cradle, it would be different. I even tried to suggest that, but we'll not get it off too far. <laughs> Created uh it creates an inversion of the molar table angles. The tooth proprioception is absolutely scrambled. Um, and heat can damage the composite structural changes. In other words, it doesn't promote the laying down of secondary dentin. Secondary dentin is the backfilling of the tooth throughout the horse's lifetime. Now, it slicks it all up and it just doesn't re reproduce. And sometimes it doesn't come back. It depends on you know how many years you've been walking that line. And I just wanted to, we've already seen this slide, but well, I we're just going wanted... back to the natural head position from the, the um, yeah. slide before, just to give everybody the idea, what is a natural, you can see the horse is just literally resting on my left arm. Now, are you still on your knees like you used to be? Uh, the knees have worn out. Um, no. Um, okay, but what, but, what but I you... do do, what I do do, Andrew, is a slightly more bent position. Okay. And it's still quite 
similar the position of the, of the hand and such, but I have to act, actually say, uh, I'm now taking on the teaching position and the coaching position way more than the player's position. And it's a very exciting time for me because I once upon a time heard somebody say, when you wake up and can't think of nothing else but what you're about to do, that's when you become it. And I really believe in coaches. Um, and I think that's what I'm trying to become is a better you're coach. You're doing a really good job. <laughs> but uh, I love I, it. I hesitate to work on the teaching side. So anyhow. No, but, but, but do you ask the, the player, you know, like Farah, are you yes, on your yes. knees still when you're down there or are you guys a little higher now or has it changed? Well, uh, no, uh, I, I promote the idea of uh, it, it, follow the horse. If they want to get down and have you on the knees, get on your knees. Um, if they would like to stand up with, you know, you they would like you to be in a standing position or a slightly bent knee position, which is what we find more so than the in the bending down on your knees position. Oh, so the horse, the horse gets to kind of select. Well, yes, exactly. Ah. I'm sure it depends, Andrew, on the height of the person right. and the height of height the, of the horse. person, height of the horse, all that stuff. But I want okay. I, this is an amazing picture, and Spencer's going to talk a little okay. bit about it. This is exactly what we were talking about, folks. You see on the left picture how it's smooth. It's less of an angle than on the right um, picture. If you notice that uh, the right picture looks a bit like a kind of um, some drunk made a cobblestone road. Um, <laughs> it does. <laughs> but you um, talked about Christmas candy. I, I see yes. it. Yeah, you see I it see now? It. You see it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Those enamel folds, there's multitudes of them, like three or four in a row. And that's what makes the noise when they um, translate. You hear this <clears throat> huge noise that is what we want it stimulates everything that we want it gets all of the uh what do you call it um the adano blasts that's what i haven't been able to say to, for days those folds hold the adano blast and they stimulate that laying down of secondary dentin but when you smooth it like in the other picture you have stopped the production of the adano blast and they don't have that um real crisp edge and therefore you're not laying down secondary dim big so, big deal so this left oh. picture is the power float picture yes and the right picture is um, by hand instruments exactly. now and the hand instruments yeah. have been, they, yeah. you can't do the precision well the reason you couldn't do the precision was these instruments were too big for where where you were trying to put them to begin with what I have done is create an ergonomically correct for the practitioner as well as the um, pa patient uh, correct in every way so that you can make the tiniest of adjustments and it's absolutely perfect. Now, here's something that really makes me sad, man. Um, this hypersemantosis or being long in the tooth thing and you see that overdevelopment of calculus there, Andrew? Yeah. The, okay, yeah. that, that is all happening because what happened through traditional dentistry, repeated, 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 you got the inversion of the bite plane to where these horses are literally eating up and down. They're getting the job done, but this is causing the front teeth to hyper erupt. It's called hypersemantosis. The vets will tell you it's hyper resorption where the, they think that the gum is receding. It's not, it's simple these teeth erupt as they wear. When you overstimulate one, there are uh, four different, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, types of ligaments in the periodontal ligament. And one of which is called a Sharpie. Dr. Sharpie in the 1970s discovered this little guy. And, <laughs> and what is cool about it is, is every, everything's okay. The Sharpies are like all cool and they hold on to stuff. But when this happens, the Sharpies say, okay, ditch it. The tooth is going into some kind of really crazy state and we need to get rid of the tooth. So all of this is being created to eliminate the tooth because it's over striking. It's over erupting is what it's doing. So this calculus that you're talking about, yeah, it, that that's actually the, the body trying to get rid of the tooth. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like an abscess to me almost. 
Yes, it, oh, it, wow. it, it, it just and the other thing is, Andrew, what you're looking at is the when this happens, these teeth become loose and wiggly. Now, did the horse actually lose that one? It looks like it's gone. It's that. a piece, yeah, but it's kind of rotted down in there. Is oh what my it really gosh. is. But okay. the other part is, is that you can reverse this. Now, on the veterinarian websites, they'll tell you there's no known cure for this. But if you'll gap the incisors very carefully, very exactly by a millimeter to two millimeters, it stops the hyper eruption of the front teeth. And now, although not perfect, it allows the back teeth to start to come to a um, crown height that would be more anatomically correct to the horse. And you may actually be able to save him and save their front teeth. Now, the, is the, the extractions of the front teeth, if that happens, run between four and six thousand dollars. And generally, who caused this to happen is the one that's extracting them. There was, there was a oh, question. Oh no! You're telling me there's practically like there's like I get paid for screwing up. Yes, exactly. Yeah, malpractice does not exist. What is E T O R H? Ethel. Thor, have you heard of that? No? Okay. All right. Rhonda, you might have to elaborate on your question there. We'll go on to the, the there's only a yeah, couple of slides could, left. Yeah. And then we're going to get to the questions and comments. Okay. Um, your chewing should be loud, not vertical. Your temporalis muscles shouldn't be overdeveloped. Um, look for atrophy in the muscle, asymmetry in the, in the body. Um, do your hips look like a, a milk cow on the horse? If so, that could be very indicative of, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, huge imbalances in your horse's mouth. Um, you can check the TMJ, uh, pressure points. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you can actually feel a, a like a notch, uh, behind the TMJ joint. And then there's like an arch in front of it that you can place your thumb on. Put a little pressure. If there's any tenderness in that joint, the horse will kind of flip its head like a flipper in a pinball machine. Now, there's a person standing alongside of this little pony. I would not be standing in that position when I checked it because that's where the horse's head is going to flip and catch you. So be aware of that. Um, I, uh, wear patterns in your incisors um, can be a, a big deal and you need to look for that. Um, if they're dropping feet or making hay balls, really be careful about just having somebody come and say, well, what are we gonna do with the teeth to fix this? Because sometimes if we have certain conditions that, a, that age has kind of helped with, you can be in a place where the TMJ is really the, the culprit and needing more help. Um, so don't just go after the teeth. Uh, sometimes it can be a trapped meniscus in the TMJ. Um, it can be a worn out meniscus. Uh, it could be a, a meniscus needing more hydration. Um, lots of different things there. So it, not just teeth. Big, big message in there. So not just teeth can cause dropping the feed or That's making what I'm trying to get balls, at. Yeah. especially. Oh, no, I get it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one like, oh, this happens, therefore fix the teeth. Yeah, so if, if you, you go to grind it on the teeth and you already you had like um, no uh, anatomically correct clinical crown height, right? Well, if you take it down more, it's not going to help it. It's going to make mm -hmm. them bigger. You know, you're going to have more feed drop out. You're going to have more hay, hay balls. So again, just another warning on older horses, horses over the age of Order 20. Um, you know, there's not much critical crown height there. Normally, we're hoping to elongate their life. We're hoping yep. to make that, that distance of the tooth from the gun line longer and longer so the horses live longer and longer. But if you already have a horse, their teeth are expiring, grinding on the teeth, are not going to help it do other things like look at look at the chiropractic explore all the possibilities this this picture of this pony is actually my pony and this is the reason i came to this course but you can see here how the side of his head is fairly flat it's a zygomatic arch and and this is this is actually yeah 
right it's, above there. It's got an arch. The other side is straight, if you notice that. Yeah, yeah, I can so see that. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Welling right here going on. And this next picture will show you exactly why. This is actually his front teeth. And there's a whole bunch of, of ledges and rims that have developed here. I'm very interested to see <laughs> what's in the back of his mouth to try to help him. So it's just like, yeah, that's a challenge, but obviously not looking anything like the horse on the, the right. <laughs> look, at, look at the symmetry, the difference, the, um, how do you say, um, um, you know, um, like the Forrest Gump looking teeth on the left, a um, little bit of, um, um, what do I want to say? refinement issue probably somewhere <laughs> in, in breeding um oh so you think there's a breeding oh. issue too huh oh yeah because any deformity of the um uh, uh pre-maxilla or pre-mandible or the palatal arch is an indirect line of like mm, we're getting we're getting to know our aunts and uncles way too well <laughs> mm. i think this might have also like if you see his lip that's missing here. I think at one point that it might have. I don't know. You don't Man, think so? Okay, never mind. Never it's mind. a nice story, but no. Are these babies that he hasn't dropped yet? I mean, he's going to erupt. Oh, no. this horse no, is no. twenty-two years old. Oh, those are. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. Say that again. This horse is twenty-two years old. Oh, the oh, the both sides of horse. Is it the same? No, this one oh. is nine. The one on the right is nine. So they're both mature yeah. adult oh, nine-year-old horses. Okay, I get it. But yeah, this which is horse, better. Oh, this isn't hard for me. It, I know which side is better. So, yeah. so this okay, last. Okay, so you got a shoe in. This last picture was really about, this is how you can at home identify, do you need to ask an equine dentist about what's going on with your horse if you see any of these signs? So I think that's it for our slide presentation. Um, but we'd love to, there's been several comments and questions as we've gone through this. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll. Andrew, do you have any comments or questions at this point, or do you want to go through these questions? Well, let me, let me just go really quick on, on one I had, but you know, the one where you, where the, um, the guy used power tools and he made it look right, right, right. That reminds me of what mine look like, right? Yeah. And it seems that if the equine dentist or whoever it is that's opening up the mouth and, and playing in there doesn't see that there's a difference between what a predator and what a prey animal need, uh, we're, we're already in a non-starter place. Isn't that true? Yes. Well, and, and the so, thing is what you're discussing about your own bite your bite has been adjusted in an improper position because we talked about this once upon a time too, where you lay down in a dental chair. Well, you uh -huh. don't walk around with your head hanging backwards. No more than that horse walked with his nose out. Oh, that's and up. right. I don't eat laying down, no. Oh, and you don't walk with your head tilted back like keep on trucking, right? So right. we're looking at you need to be in a dental office that has got at least one place where they kind of have a wall-mounted unit that does an MRI of your mouth in the bite plane in relationship to the anatomically correct positioning of your TMJ. It's huge. You can make your patients in those positions. You just need to make sure that all when they stand up are what you need. Yeah, I got it. But I guess my point was, is we, we are, we bite more like this and they're yes. biting like this. Isn't that correct? And so right. it's, and it's two thing, different, the other, they're two different things, right? Well, they are. And they're two different inclinations too, as well, Andrew. The horse has this inclination that um, is, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you have the upside on the uh, lowers on the inside, and then the outside is the uh of the uppers is your um what do you call it edge yeah the exact opposite is true in in a human you actually slope to the inside not to the outside so it's it's it, it's a completely different thing yeah your inclination and therefore your mechanics okay so, well 
Um, let's switch over to Farah choosing the questions because I think you guys are. Right. That's cool. Yeah. And that's awesome. And I'm glad you brought that up, Andrew, because I thought that was pretty fascinating about how the bites are, you know, the angle of inclination is actually opposite. It's pretty interesting. So it looks like um, you already answered the question, do horses always choose in the same direction? Um, and the answer was hopefully not. Hopefully they're going in, you know, both directions. If they're going in one direction all the time, then that would be something to check. And so um, whoever iPhone, thank you for the question. She said that was brown groundbreaking. Yes. <laughs> I'd say most horses need to be put down due to bad teeth as a reason. So we have um, another comment, been using Spencer uh, dentist graduates for over 12 years, never go back, just wish there were more people out there doing it. Well, there's a nice class going on right now. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> oh, you're creating more of them. Yes, yeah, we got, we got a lot more people in the studio uh, trying to get it picked up. Yeah, it's cool. And she says, I wish the vet board would get out of the way. Um, <laughs> Katie well, under, agrees. <laughs> understand that, you know, one of the things is history always repeats itself. And chiropractics in the 40s, they imprisoned people for doing it. And then in the 50s and the 60s, when those people were released from jail, um, they were allowed to become the teachers. So everybody's had their own cross to bear. Right. We, well, we just gotta keep fixing it up, and making it right. For the horse yeah. you know and uh, i see the next one which is the um ali said is this a very common practice in the equine world or is it not really taken off yet and i'm going to say uh, i'm going to make a conjecture then you can correct which i think that it's evolving but yeah. i don't know that there's that many i mean i think we're still it's almost like natural horsemanship we're just really starting to get some 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 uh traction on the world understanding why you want to have a relationship with a horse well at the same time i was lucky enough to see you and get to know you and and hire right. you i actually wait when spencer came out from new york to be on the west coast and he would do my horses and renee and i always were looking forward to when he would come of course we have fun with him anyway but um and you were always explaining to me that, hey, Andrew, we're doing a lot of work now that's going to do less later. And sure enough, um, you know, here I am with, with two 26-year-old horses that are very healthy with regard to, you know, their, their top line and their, their body. Um, but as we talk about how it's going out, one of the things that you've done is you created something like what Pat and Linda created with the star system over there for their... I mean, you created a levels, they create a levels program for us amateurs and that to get to a certain point, professionals, they have a star program so you can look at where somebody's progressing. You went progressive in designing essentially a similar system for dentists that you train and then each one of them have to go through certification, they have to go through relearning. And then you even carry a license or, or a, yeah. well, a, a car idea. and then then if Card that shows you're a member in good standing. The other thing that's in there, Andrew, is that um, we felt that the public needed some, um, how do you say, way of identifying A, a neuromuscular dentist, B, one in good standing. Um, the other thing is, is that um, the uh, card system to me was uh, I came from the rodeo cowboy world if I pulled into your rodeo and I showed you as the fellow guard in the back gate you saw my card you saw it on the name on the sheet you go oh okay it all checks out come on in well you know what to expect professionalism quality all of the best that's what I hope to bring forward with this plus the fact that you see this is a new science. I mean, teaching a known science is one thing, but chart stepping off into the unknown and trying to re and actually regain knowledge that was like, you know, a few hundred years old. Our speculum design is over 300 years old. <laughs> it's only the difference is cast iron versus stainless steel. Um, you know, very, but this has all been done before, uh, at least with the hand instruments. And I mean, hundreds of years ago. 
now we're just rediscovering something and it seems like a new discovery kind of thing but it's not um the um the the big the big uh push is finally getting people that are they're investing themselves in an education we're getting people to write papers on the things that they get interested in we are developing a great um what do you call it library of many different papers that the students are writing and that's what we discuss every year at uh, continuing education and they come back for that every two years it's amazing and i'm proud of every one of them because that the, they are the uh, beginning of what will be um, how to balance them out and then how to yeah. maintain and maybe you know 20 years from now and I'm really wishful thinking that we could have horses 40 years old and 50 years old and it would be the norm and where would it come from MBD man over the oh, edge I love it well you know I want to go back to something you said 20 years ago or 23 years ago 2000 Wait a minute, I got short term memory loss. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, I know. I hear you. <laughs> but you told me at the time that, it, that it, a dentist, a quine, a veterinarian, were in vet school in yes. four years, saw 45 minutes of equine dentistry. Well, at one to 10 time. hours, one to 10 hours as an elective. And actually in 1996, Equus Magazine made a study and they published it in 97 and 75% of your veterinarian colleges had no interest in changing their program whatsoever. And, and, and where do you think, has it, has it improved in 20 years? Do we, have we seen the- no. no, it's gotten worse because we gave them machine guns to go bird hunting with. Okay, so part of what That's we want to do, analogy. yeah, no, you know, Ryan, I, and I, I always want to remind people of kind of what the mission we are here in this, in the IHA Live, is we cover the revolution in horsemanship and what it means to mankind, inspired by Dr. Miller, and because this is a continuing thing, he wrote about that 15 years ago, but right. Dr. Miller also, because you've connected with him and you you have a lot of respect. Absolutely. For him. I, I've been blessed to be connected with a lot of really cool people in the horse industry and um, introduced to them way before, I say, my talent would invite me into the world, their world, if you will. Yeah. And because I got invited in at an early age and got such stages as the Savvy Conference, where it was worldwide. I mean, it was cool. It was like being in the Olympics. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. Talk all different kinds of languages. You're learning all these different things. You're trying to share all these different things. Uh, and it was just an amazing time. And then where that led to, because then I met people, like uh, I can't remember the husband and wife team from Australia, but one year I was at Indio, California at the big show jumping thing. I worked there about 15 days hopped on a plane, slept for 16 hours, woke up in Australia. The the lady that was uh, uh, running the, um, you know, the service in the plane, she said, like, we got really worried about you. You never woke up. I'm like, I was tired, man. I, I sleep a little bit. And, uh, you know, 16 hours was a nice nap for me. And uh, <laughs> ready to go find the uh, inner part of Australia. And man, I mean to tell you, I was like a typical tourist down there. I had to ask if they had a gronk, you know, like the Australian um, uh, crocodile Dundee. And they did. They really did, man. They had this guy came in the pub every day at like four and they took me down and I met him and it was wild. I mean, a typical Aussie, you know what I mean? I mean it in the best of ways. Beautiful people having a great time. Well, long, I, long trip. So, but part of this thing though is that we want to further along we this is an educational program and and so we really do want to further along the revolution but we also want to do it in the with the practitioners and do you have any ideas besides just continue to do what you do how we might be able to influence this to go faster in terms of adoption by the um by the, the powers of be of, of recognition that there's a new paradigm really that they need to look at. And then the second one is, is increasing the supply. I mean, 
Pirelli Foundation, one of the things we work on is increasing the supply of natural horsemanship instructors. Well, I'm suddenly saying, wow, we need to increase the supply of neuromuscular dentists. Well, you know, it's uh, high sight, very uh, fortuitous that you mentioned that. I have just recently um, myself taken over answering the emails and the inquiries because we found that we really needed somebody that could talk to the people, not just answer, tell me later where they were, what the situation was, blah, blah, blah. If I answer, then it's got them an answer right away. But one of the things I had to say a lot of times is we don't have a practitioner there. And I finally figured out when people inquired, I said, okay, okay, you're having an awareness for wanting this. Who's the person in your area that might want to learn this? Send me somebody, send me somebody. Oh, we'll idea. send you the people home that can give you the answer. Oh, this I love is, it. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I'm one of the only um, dental schools that doesn't sell you instruments. In other words, I don't make instruments so that I can have your uh, cost of coming into this business be very high. I'm about giving you the exact things you need, very minimalistic, but with a huge opportunity for a very good career and income that will allow you to pursue your interest of your horsemanships yourself. Because oh. unbelievable as it may seem, I like to do things with my own horse rather than just go out and work. I, I remember saying that one time to Linda Pirelli. I'm like, you know, Linda, I actually do ride. <laughs> well, Andrew, I just want to make sure because there's so many comments and questions here. Um, if yeah, no, go, let's go back to the questions. I, I just wanted to get that reference about Ah. The difference between the training involved, you know, what you guys are doing now and what, who were hiring before. Oh, mm -hmm. and, and look at the results we were getting. Now we got a chance of increasing live the horse. Okay, go. I'm sorry. Take it back, Tara. Tara no, thank you. That's, yeah. that's no problem. Well, in the, 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 the group that came out of Canada, um, we can recommend that you go to our website and there are practitioners. I'm not exactly sure when you say our part of Canada. Um, In their area of Canada. Right, yeah. But what province are we talking about? There's lots of them up there. If you go to the website and Lisa LaFleur posted in the chat as yes. well, the, the website there, there is some literature on there as well as uh, I think the link to the YouTube video. And yes. we will be posting this. And then after that, definitely contacting Spencer at the website. Um, it's Janie or Janie, I think would be your best um, follow up for that one. Would you agree with that, yes. Spencer? Yes. Okay. And then it's, there was- It's dentistry.com. It's simple. I mean, it's yeah. a lot, but it's neuromusculardentistry.com. Yes. And there's a comment from iPhone. She said, my vet smooths out the edges of my horse's teeth and that's it. I get it done every year. This is making me realize that there's a lot more to this than just smoothing out the teeth. So yes, mission there accomplished. Is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now here's a good question. Are the horses sedated in neuromuscular equine dentistry method like they are in your average teeth float? No, they're, yes, they are. No, they're not because they're not sedated. They're given an adrenaline block. So that all your horse is experiencing is life without adrenaline. But with the particular drug that's used, which is dormicidin or demosidin, um, it can be given 200 to 400 times its uh, recommended dosage. And because it's a adrenaline block, it's not harmful to your horse. Now, sedatives can slow heart rate, can slow respiration, can slow this, can slow that. And yes, that can be very, very tricky. And over sedation of horses is rampant in equine dentistry. But the, a minimal amount of a, of a adrenaline block, like three tenths of a cc, four tenths possibly, being a maximum dose to work on a horse, but you wait 10 minutes. And by that 10 minute, it becomes blood level. All the receptors for the um, uh, uh, adrenaline have been coated by this drug. 
and then you can't get the horse popping in and out of it. They mm. stayed level throughout the whole thing. That's why you saw that horse's head in the position you saw it in when I was working on them. They're not completely down and out and they're not spiking every once in a while because what, where that comes from is people experience extreme use or really heavy doses of sed sedation. And because the reason being is that they don't wait the 10 minutes. They go in in two to three or three to five minutes and boom, the, oh, he needs another shot. Well, yeah, that's like drilling before you, you're numb. Cause at least yeah, you've got a yeah. Key. yeah. Yeah, yeah, numb. yeah. And if you're somebody like me, that's absolutely scared to death of a human dentist, you don't start on me. You don't even get me into your room without sedating me. <laughs> no, uh -uh. I'm a very good, how do you say, practitioner awareness of the patient feeling a, a lot of, of um, uh, insecurity. Yeah. So I'm like the horse's best friend when it comes to this. Don't worry, buddy. We got laughing gas. We got everything you need. We take care of you from start to finish and you back to mom and dad and you'll be told tapping your little way to you know river dance usa but i think like you said, the adrenaline blocker they're, they're still quite aware yes. what's going on versus sedation they become completely unaware because they really can continue to participate yeah no they are very aware of what's going on they're very there because they as i said and as you go on you can use less like a minimal of like 0.2 it's really necessary because any motion of the head is like moving something that you're trying to balance in a very fine way and well, you can't get the balance if it's moving all over the place that's what you're paying for so there's another question um about you and why you started doing uh dentistry in the first place okay um like everything it's not a short story um i'm partly <laughs> truth, partly fiction i'm a walking contradiction but here it goes i was at a friend of mine's funeral and somebody said, boy, we're going to sure miss Rex. And I'm like, Rex, the guy I know, I mean, Rex could be his own worst friend. And um, they said, no, no, he was helping horses. And I'm like, helping horses? What do you mean helping horses? And they're like, oh, yeah, he went to this dental school. And I'm like, oh, I want to go there because I was doing a lot of horsemanship. But what happened was I'd get the horse in a better place, send it back to the people. The people were still doing the same old stuff. And they'd call you up and go, you can have your damn horse back. It's like, it's not mine. It was yours. No, it's yours now because I don't want him around here anymore. And you know, you just went back to doing the same things. And I had, I had great horses, but I was getting too many. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe they need a dentist. And so I went out there. And the first thing I realized was, boy, you can, you know, write your ticket and go to the penthouse. And it's like, we're moving on up, you know, to the deluxe apartment in the skies. Um, it's going to be. You just make bank. You make bank if you do this well. Oh, six figures, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I remember. And I don't mean it. I mean it in a very good way. And if you want to yeah. go to Hawaii, I know people that would love to have you over there. I don't want to be there. I mean, I'm scared to death of islands. No, thanks. I'll stay on the main line. Y'all go ahead. I'll be right here when you get back. But it's, but it's, I mean. It's just like going to somebody for any service. You're getting what you're paying for, right? Yeah. Your education. So um, there's nothing wrong with making. That's why you started doing I'm it. I'm a because... capitalist. I I like to that to make money. But it's yeah, good to yeah. know that you can enter this a reasonable, field. Reasonable. Reasonable. Right. I'm sorry. Right. It's like it's like uh, Carol Shelby in the um the Mustang. Okay, we create horsepower. Carol Shelby was. If you ever saw the movie Ford versus Ferrari, he's the man that created horsepower. Ford had his design on the Mustang, but Carroll Shelby is the one that made it forever go down in history as one of the baddest ass muscle cars there ever was. That's what we got going on. Uh, average barrel racing, if they have been power floated, power floated, power floated, we can take a quarter to a half a second guaranteed off of their best time. I can I show have you friends that would just be going crazy if oh, they and, and blow your mind, man. And when they do it, 
and then they go and, and they go to these big fraternities. I mean, 900 girls going to one fraternity for 50,000 added, right? Um, they asked this lady, well, what do you attribute? Um, um, I can't remember the horse's name. I'll call him Johnny. Anyhow, he had an arena record up there in Redding, uh, California. I can't remember exactly, but it was three years beforehand. They brought Johnny back. We balanced his mouth up. The lady says, you think he could do it again? I'm like, oh, yeah, easy. Probably faster than he did it the last time. Mm -hmm. And she's like, really? I said, it won't take. It's not me just doing the mouth. you got to go out and you know, get Johnny reconditioned. And they did. He blew them all away. Now, here's the ironic part. The people asked, what did you do? Well, I got this uh, neuromuscular dentist. Well, it couldn't have just been dentistry. What did you do? And they're telling them. And these people come back to me and they go, I'm telling them what I did, but nobody believes me. You know, they just, it's he just a resistance to that being the solution. Right. They're, yeah, not, they're not ready to no. hear it. Yeah. It's got to be coming from someplace else. If your chiropractors are constantly coming and it's the same thing. Well, then your balance in your mouth is not correct in your horse. Um, if you have ghost lamenesses that come and go, splints that have no explanation. I had a lady one time, she went to the big um, uh, world show in uh, Perry, Georgia for the barrel racing. And um, one of her friends had said, oh, I remember you had shin splints last year. What did you do to take care of that? She said, oh, my dentist took care of that. No, no, no. I mean, who took care of it? She goes, no, my dentist took care of that. Because we changed the, the stride link and the proprioception was returned to the feet. So instead of just pounding the ground and tearing their legs up, they actually have a much bigger stride and it's a float, a definite float that you can see. Wow. So there, there's some really great questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, let's go back to the questions, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 it's awesome. That's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> Allie says her 17 year old horse chokes if her grain is not soaked. So she gets hot bran mash once a day. She gets her teeth floated every three months due to a previous dental issue. Wow, three months. Um, but she still chokes on hard feed. Do you think this is due to teeth issues or just rushing and eating? Uh, mm. that, that's, a, that's a Pandora's box. Um, it, it could be a lot to do with, there's a dry portion. You, you're saying your horse is 17 years old. I'm saying, um, you could have a very dry portion of the, um, uh, 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 uh what am I trying to say here? The, um, oh, their esophagus. Yeah. Their esophagus. <laughs> and that can cause chronic choke. Um, and you may need like a, um, what do I want to say? Uh, artificial saliva to coat that so that the horse could eat and, and that could where be would possible. you get that ah yeah well that's a trick um it's not around every uh, corner but artificial saliva is um uh, used in human medicines uh, for people that have radiation burns and such uh from uh, cancer treatments so you might look there um and if anybody out there knows uh, maybe because they're related to that uh, part of the world, uh, please um, give us a shout, shout out and uh, let us know where you might find that for those people. Right. And I'm also wondering where so it says previous dental issues. I would be interested in exactly what that would yeah, be. Yeah, well, the issue is, and, is the, the individual that won't change what they're doing. But it sounds like an awful lot of floating every three months. Yeah, right? every three months. Under what is going on so maybe you yeah. should write more it would be interesting to have more detail about that Allie uh, maybe yeah you but see the it. thing is is if they're doing it every three months to try to stop the choking it ain't working so why you keep doing it so there's there's something else going on try so, something else I remember Ray Hunt saying one time I don't know what something else is but try it you 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 look intelligent <laughs> yeah and um, oh, okay, so Ada asked a question. Uh, she was talking, I'm pretty sure, about the hypercementosis, Ada. Um, and she said, what is it in the top picture? What is that material? She says her horse, Kai, always has it. 
and the vet always removes it and it's back within two months. How old's the horse? How old is he now? Out of like 11? 11. She just wrote 11, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I would t tend to tell you that you, the reoccurring part of it is, is the, 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 the individual that's doing your dentistry is focused on an edge and you don't really have the, the contact and the proper anatomical dental uh, arcade development. And therefore you're putting all that pressure out on those front teeth and that's where it's showing up. But you can change that by, um, how you say, um, probably um, vibrational therapy, number one, which is causing the teeth to erupt, make excuse me, make contact again. And um, then uh, very, very, uh, how you say, very lightly, very, very delicately make minor, minor changes to, to try to restore all that. And so it make minor changes in the incisors you're thinking, or just minor changes? Everywhere? Minor changes in general. In general, yes. in the balance. But, but I mean, like you'd be looking at it and if you were watching somebody over your shoulder, you'd say you didn't do anything. Yeah, that's the, the whole idea. You should, it, it should look to you like it was nothing, but it was precise. It was like, it, it would sound like just a ch -ch -ch and not a long, piece of a, uh, a stroke with a float it would be very short very precise and like once would do it i would definitely take pictures at a and keep track please and yeah the vibrational therapy he was talking about he was he was saying you could use a pair of clippers or you can actually use a massager and put it on the the teeth and it will actually promote the production of that secondary dentin yes um so that's a pretty cool therapy that you can, everyone can do. Um, so the, this question Rhonda asked about the, the um, EOTHRH, right. um, she said, and this was in relation to the hypercementosis, right. she said, is that an infection that happens in the root of the teeth to absorb the roots, causing all the incisors to be removed? No, it's, it's not at all. It, it's the fact that there's no contact in the molars and all the contact came to the incisors. And these are just hyper erupting. It is not a, an infection in the root or anything. It's not a disease. Um, this is another thing that our medical world loves to come up with. Everything is a, is a disease. It's not a disease. It's just there's no, there's 36 teeth. They're all supposed to have about contact equally. When you eliminate 24 out of 36, you put a heavy load on 12 and it doesn't take long for it to fail. The system fails. We go back to the Sharpie thing. When that uh, particular part of the ligament says system fail, it aborts the mission. That's what's happening. Those Sharpies have said, Turn it off, kick them out. We're done. And so that was be due to the imbalance and possible gap in the molars and premolars, right. Rhonda. So yeah, it's putting it, extra pressure on those incisors. And it and, hyper erupts. And that's actually it does causing what it's supposed to do. more eruption. So it's not actually an infection. So that's pretty fascinating information. Kathy says, uh, what are you seeing in the mouths of horses and ponies who eat out of slow feeder hay nets? A multitude of things. Hmm. Uh, some things good, some things not so good. Um, some horses actually get such excessive wear on their incisors from these different types of feeders that it can be actually not, not as productive and as... Um, how do I say, once uh, such a, a, a path to follow, if you will. Um, it's got its pluses and its minuses. I don't think it's uh, to be written off the books, but we might really kind of, kind of think about how can we get softer materials that might not wear the teeth if the horses are really rubbing their teeth, the front of their teeth are really, in some of them being worn away. And, and actually, Kathy, um, I know Kathy personally, and you know my horse, Wesley, um, 
he, I, I've been purchasing the hay chicks hay nets because they're so tough. And I've discovered that the front of his incisors was actually wearing off and uh, because of the hay nets and also where you're hanging the hay nets, it's so important that they're really at ground level, that they're not twisting their neck and eating at a weird angle out of those hay nets. So, but then other, other ones of my horses, which may be a genetic thing, um, are not affected by those knots. There are hay nets that don't have knots in them um, that I'm gonna experiment with, but I, I think it's really important that you know what to look for in your own horse. And it, if you start to see that wear on your incisors, you know, stop the hay net or change your hay net, do something differently. It's going to affect their entire body. I got to um, get in on this one question, right? Yeah, now. which one? Um, there, but they did, 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 uh, um, what was it? Yeah, here we go. Um, thank you. Explaining for more about the TMJ. Can you explain what happens to the hyoid apparatus when horses can't get good AP movement? Absolutely. It becomes like a frozen joint in there and that apparatus is in the tongue and it's slung up into the inner ear. And the whole thing of the ancient horseman was the bits and the progression of bits were about developing the um, uh, communication to the inner ear, which is the center of balance. And it's all done with, you know, just a touch just a touch when so many people have done way too much and they go, Oh, it's the bit, it's the bit. Well, not so much. It's the hands behind the bit. And it's also the mental stability of the individual behind them. And if you look at it, it can be a five-year journey to create what they call a bridal horse. Now that big spade bit that sits in there for almost a year and no one touches it. It's if the horse will go into vertical, that palatal uh, spoon that they have will come off the palate. Now you got a vertical headset without ever doing anything to the horse <laughs> other than placing this, well, you built up to that bit be going in, but that spoon, when it's vertical, it, it comes off the roof of the mouth of the horse. That's where the horse will go for comfort. Now you see this like joystick movement of the horse's reins and there's very little motion i mean it's microscopic yeah your hands are moving big time i mean i'm talking about what you know just a little brother i mean tighten your fingers together uh push them forward you don't even see the hand move it's just the fingers well and i just think the fingers. some of the big arrows would actually attach the reins to their belly button or yeah their, or their uh belt buckle so it was not about their hands it was just about moving their body ever so slightly oh, wow so, yeah that's pretty that's cool awesome. so thank you for that um irene says if we have a vet that uses an electric apparatus would be would it be best to go longer than a year before getting your teeth no it'd be loaded? best to get a natural a neuromuscular dentist in there and get the vet back to doing what vets do i mean that in a good way <laughs> It's just, I think it's really hard to recover after a power float. Um, well, you know, the thing is, is if somebody's using an instrument that really doesn't understand what they're in there doing, and I mean this in the best of ways, but if you don't know what you're doing, just because I have a license in veterinarian medicine doesn't mean you have a license to perform dentistry because doctors don't do dentists. Dentists don't do doctors. There's a reason why that's separated. And and I mean, I really tried to make the, the <laughs> float, uh, the, the slide about the, the power float, like as least controversial as possible. But I just, well, no, there's... You, you can't avoid controversy when people just don't allow for it. But I got to do this one right here, mm -hmm. if time allows. Spencer, what about the Morgan horse uh, skeleton at the UVM? That's from my wife, Lisa. We went to the Morgan horse farm because it was a dream of hers to see this whole thing. They have a skeleton in this uh, um, at the University of Vermont at the farm. It's a skeleton of the original stallion. And I, it's a glass case. And I'm like looking at it going, 
I want to get in there. I want to put my hands in that skeleton. I want to find out the spacing. I, I want to, <laughs> and all of a sudden, the person that's going to give the next tour of the facility comes up and she's like, well, what are you talking about? And I started talking to her. Well, that was going to be the first person that was going to take a tour. Well, the tour never happened. And Lisa and a group of people just stood around and this lady and I started talking about the horse. And as Lisa said, she lost her tour guide because the tour guide was a vet uh, student. And she's like, this is fascinating. Tell me more. So we keep talking. And while she and I just start a conversation, like there's nobody else there. Well, then there's another tour lady that comes along and she gets into the conversation and it takes three of them to show up to finally get these people that are waiting for the tour to leave because I've got all these vet students mesmerized by what I'm saying. That's what she wanted me to talk about, how I stole the day from her. I took her, I took her to the UVM farm, but she never got the tour because they... Did it, yeah. Yeah, we never left. <laughs> well... You know, to that end, um, Linda Pirelli's father, uh, Dr. Patterson, yes. Yes. is a dentist, and that's, or at least he may, he's perhaps retired, um, but yes, he retired. And at the time he was a practicing dentist, and you got to know um, Linda, and in fact, he helped you kind of get into the inner circle with him, because when you talked to him, he went, oh, wow, this, this, this guy who's rodeo cowboy turned dentist yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't have right. the, you don't have all the degrees and all the things and he went this is real stuff and so all of a sudden because dr yeah, he said to them if your dentist is not talking about what this kid's talking about you're falling behind and he said if he this is where he's starting out at hang on it's going to be a hell of a ride and that's what yeah, he and then, told me and i mean true truly i was originally hired because of her father and then every year at the savvy conference he'd come to visit with me and he'd go what's new what's going on what are you thinking about what are you doing and it was lovely to bounce it off of his head because he'd been a great dentist in australia a human dentist and very yeah. progressive not just you know here's what we do and we just do it this way because we've done it for 30 years no he was that cutting edge kind of guy no pun intended um you know uh, all the way and it was a really a blessing to have people like that that took an interest in me yes. that helped me expand my horizon. And I would say that's the big ticket where I got so much information way over and beyond what most people, when you go and talk about equine dentistry, solely equine dentistry, the conversation gets straight, um, uh, very... Um, non-educational um, uh it's you take the edges off and that's about all there is to it i mean think about it you take a very intelligent person and tell them all you got to do is take the edge off well they're going to make it just what you said but it's not what you said so if you got misdirected in the fact that it was so simple it was very you know just do this well it's not their fault that they got in this mud hole but it's their fault that they're still stuck in it. Yeah, good analogy. Okay, so we've got a comment from Kathy in Quebec. Uh, she said, I like the way that people are becoming more involved with their horses' hooves, and I'm looking forward to people uh, being more educated enough to do their horses' teeth. I began trimming hoof trimming when I was barefoot trimming 54 years ago. Kathy's awesome. Um, I told... I was told I was wrong for so many years and finally we had the barefoot movement. I've seen some horrible things done to my horse's teeth and it took a long time to correct them. And then I ran into Spencer many years ago with Dino. Ah, and, big bear. And it got turned on to how the teeth affect the whole body. Thank you, Spencer. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank <laughs> you for the opportunity. And thank you for the reflection back on big bear. I got to tell a little story about that. One day we went to Hershey Park, not Hershey Park, but where's the place that's out there? Knott's Berry Farm. Oh, Knott's California. Berry Farm down in Southern California, sure. Yeah, right, right. And there's a big fiberglass bear, right? And so yeah. I said, Dino's girlfriend who was with us, I said, here, take a picture. We'll, we'll wait for me to get set up next to Dino. 
and I'm going to grab the big bear's paw and I'm going to grab his paw. And when I go now, I'm going to drop to my knees because I'm going to have my shoes off and it's going to look like I'm here with my uncle Dino. And man, it was the coolest picture. And his, the look on his face, he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, just funny, man. Come on. <laughs> so we're probably not going to have, we're going to push you and kind of pick some of these questions. Yeah. Uh, but any other questions that you have, please direct them to Spencer's website, Neuromuscular. Uh, is it equine dentistry? It's up in the chat uh, here. No, actually, if you'll direct it to 4thorse at gmail.com. And that's that's the number four. Or the letter T. -E T -E horse. The horse. At right. Or not, not T H E. It's oh. the letter, the number four, the letter T, horse. H O R T. So at for G the horse at gmail.com. For the horse. Okay. Or D oh, horse. Yeah, at least to put it up and I'll make sure it shows up on the screen. Yeah, on the... Cool, cool. That's how I'll yeah. get it. And please uh, allow me to get through school. I'm going to have to get home before I can start answering these things. So um, I'm a bit uh, technically challenged, but uh, we'll You're get to everyone. You're doing so good. Yeah, well, doing we so adapt. Good. Us kind of the cowboys, we're not going to go, uh, how do you say, fading away. All right, there's some there's some wonderful questions, but please in the chat, if you don't mind, if you enjoy this presentation, uh, please let Spencer know. Um, I drug him into this and I'm so thankful that he came. A uh, couple more questions. Um, let's see, uh, there was a comment that my horses are quite happy when they have their teeth done. They don't even need sedation. Um, they're so relaxed. So that's exciting. Uh, Rachel just uh, says, um, I bet bad mouths being treated with power tools is why horses are breaking down on the track. Yes, plus inbreeding because your track horses went, your thoroughbreds in the 1900s went from 100 different bloodlines down to 30. And yeah, then that's a whole another conversation. That's a whole other topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to even get into that whole thing. I don't want to make the, uh, how do you say, the royalty and British upset. Uh, Addis says, thank you so much uh, for the answer about the uh, accumulation mm. of that material in her horse's teeth. She was always told her horse just had dirty teeth. Mm, no. <laughs> no, I love it. Well, okay. Vera, let me let me take it to, over to summarize because we'll, uh, you know, we can go all night, obviously, with this. But what I asked you guys to do during the pre-call was to bring a consumer's approach so that we as consumers could be in a better position to, to know, you know, what's available to us. And I remember you were describing with hands and you were kind of doing there. I want to thank you guys so much because obviously in the couple of days that's gone by, you did some phenomenal work getting this in a position where I went from, okay, I kind of get it to, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you're talking about. This was a brilliant night. And it's part of the revolution in horsemanship is also how we care for our horses. You're a revolutionary, my friend. You're one of the guys that proves that dyslexia shouldn't hold you back because you're going to find another superpower. You are a superpower guy with that. With it, it, You've applied it in the right place. You're my, my good friend. I hope you'll always be in my life, my buddy. And of course, Farah, I work with you all the time. And I, you know, I just, I really appreciate that you guys were willing to come on our show tonight and make a difference in this. Well, program. Andrew, I want to thank you for the opportunity to re reconnect with you um, and uh, be uh, um, blessed to be part of your show, part of your, uh, meet your audience. Uh, it's awesome. And it's also very awesome just to see your face, um, hear about Renee, hear about the family. Um, it's really cool because um, it was a big family. And um, we always look forward to all the visits and all the wonderful people. Um, please, again, give my love to Dee Dee and Richard. I will. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I remember all y'all. and. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I'm forever grateful for the opportunities to do work 
when it was in its infantile stages because um, my hat's off to all of you. They gave me the opportunity to find out that A, there wasn't a horse that this didn't fit so that it was okay to go ahead and teach other people because I'm a big um, uh, uh, proponent of um, don't teach the stuff that you half-ass know for being a fact. If it ain't a fact, it ain't a fact. If it is, then go go share it. Uh, Morgan Freeman one time said, uh, wait, if you have a talent, all you have after that is to hone that talent, sharpen that talent, um, get uh, very excellent with it, and then share that knowledge with others. I love it. Spencer, Spencer has been so generous about sharing all of his knowledge while I'm here. It's just been a wonderful experience. Thank you for all your beautiful comments. Yes. I, I a million thank yous. I and the I so appreciated this. And Andrew, I want to get this out as soon as possible. Um, so I'll be working on it while I'm here too, and you can improve it. Um, but thank you, everyone, and um, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you all. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much. May the horse be with you. Everyone Peace, love, rubber dub glove, farm you. stop, truck stop. Don't care where you stop. Stop by the ranch sometime. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be putting the the link on Bye. the IHA uh, Facebook page as well as the website. Give our luck right. to Renee. All right, I sure will. She, she thank she, you, Lisa. She really appreciate Bye. you, buddy. Thank you. All right, All right guys. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Good yes, night. Thank you, Andrew. Good night.